Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Our time together this morning is going to be spent looking at Acts chapter 2. It's actually our second reading for this morning, so you're welcome to kind of open up there in your bulletins so you can follow along a little bit with us this morning. Um, Today is Trinity Sunday. And while I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about the Trinity, because every analogy you can draw to the Trinity breaks down somewhere. You've got the fun, the water, you know, the H2O analogy of the Trinity. It's, it can be a liquid, a solid, and a gas all at the same time, and yet it's still the same chemical compound. And yet that breaks down because you have to have the exact perfect conditions for it to operate as vapor, water, and ice, right? It has to be the perfect conditions for that. And yet God can be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all the time because it's always the perfect conditions. Or there's the apple, you've got the core, and then you've got the flesh, and you've got the skin. It's still apple, but three different parts, and yet I, you don't eat the spirit, so that's kind of weird. Um, or the s'more, I've never heard that one before. And again, I don't want to roast God, so probably not a good idea uh, to do that one. And so there's all these great things that, that we can use to talk about the, the Trinity, and yet none of them really are going to match up with how great and vast and massive the Trinity truly is. And so today, I want you to focus on the fact that God is Father, and, and Father is, is the, the one that, that loves and cares and creates. The Father is, is kind of the, the arms that wrap around the entire thing. And then the Son is the one that comes in and, and just kind of walks around and localizes God to a specific place in a specific time. And so underneath the arms of God, you have the Son walking in the world, still God, and yet still man, really cool stuff. And then the Holy Spirit is kind of like that wind you feel right now that you wish would stop. That's the Holy Spirit. Goes where He wants, does what He wants, He blows when you don't want Him to, and He stops when you do want Him to. He's always there. Sometimes you feel it stronger, and sometimes you feel it lesser. So you have Father wrapping around the Son, walking in, and the Spirit filling all. As we, want to, as we move into our lesson for this morning from Acts chapter 2, we remember that the Father is over this whole entire scenario, and the Son was a, an integral part in the middle of it, and, and then the Spirit is the one that gives us the power to make it through it. And so if you remember last week, we talked about Pentecost. Pentecost was the, the day when they were gathered in the house, in, in, that, in that room, and there were about 100 or 120 of them or so in there, and, and things were going really well, and they were talking about Jesus probably, and they're sitting there sharing the memories and all the fun stuff, and then all of a sudden, a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It was like a tornado without the wind, just the noise. It was just the noise. It doesn't say there was a mighty wind. It was the sound of a mighty rushing wind filled the town. And everybody comes running. Now, there were people from all over the place present in Jerusalem at this time. And they come running in because they want to know why in the world is this noise happening. It's like a freight train running through town, and trains didn't even exist yet. So they had no idea what it was. Little tongues of fire light up on their head, and the disciples start talking. And they start talking, and they're talking in languages they didn't even know they knew because they didn't know them. And so they're talking and, and they're speaking this, this message and it's in, it's in all these different dialects and everybody present comes to hear. And, and so you've got, you've got the, the, the Greeks over here and you've got the, the Medes over here and all these different people groups are gathered and, and they're hearing the message of the gospel preached in their own language and people were in awe and they stood back and they're like, whoa, this is great stuff. And then some of them, some of them were like, yeah, but that's not possible. They got to be drunk. I don't know. I, I worked in a bar for a while when I was in college, and I never ever saw a drunk person speak coherently in their own language, let alone in a foreign language they never knew. So I don't know why that's the, that's the, that's the answer they came up with, was like, yeah, drunk people talk really, really well in, in the Mead language. No, they're blubbering idiots who trip over themselves and slobber all down their shirts. No. Okay, so here we are. You've got the, the, the people are gathered and they're like, they got to be drunk. And, and so Peter, you, you remember Peter, right? Peter's the guy who always has something to say. 
And when he has something to say, he's never afraid to say it. You know, Peter, the one who saw Jesus walking on the water, and he jumps out of the water and starts booking it across the water. And he's like, hey, guys, check it out. I'm walking on the water. He goes, whoa, I'm walking on the water. Down he goes. Ah, that Peter. The same Peter who said, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, way to go, Peter, add a boy. And then Jesus says, yeah, but by the way, that plan about dying, it's just not going to happen that way. I got a better idea. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Peter, the same guy who when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden, Peter says, I am going to hurt you bad and chop off your ear. I don't know why he chose the ear. I think he was swinging for the neck and he just missed. I don't know how that works. But regardless, so we have, we have Peter. And Peter, the mouthpiece of the people. Peter, the mouthpiece of the church at the time. The church didn't even exist yet. So he's the mouthpiece of all these disciples gathered and they says, yeah, they are drunk. And Peter stands up and says, men, they're not drunk. That's not the way this works. Because I don't know if you realize it or not, people, but uh, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. And the bars haven't even opened yet. You can't be drunk. He didn't really say the bars bit. I just added that. So he goes, no, they're not drunk. They're, how, how can they be drunk? It's only nine in the morning. That's ridiculous. So there's something bigger is happening. And so Peter starts talking. And this is what he says in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. This is, this is great. This is great stuff. Like, he could tell them anything. If you had... A, this is an interactive part of the sermon, so you can shout out your answer, and I'll try to uh, capitalize on your answer for just a second. If you could pick anything in the world to speak of, when someone says, hey, why are you so into this Jesus thing, and the, Bible, the church thing, and the Bible thing, what would you, what's one story you would tell them? You got a story out of the Bible you would share? Well, yeah, not a story from your childhood. Good grief. What, what, what's, what's your story from the Bible you would tell somebody who says, why do you believe in the whole God thing? I'm sorry? Feeding of the 5,000. That's a great story. I love that story. Five loaves, two fish, the whole deal. And he had 12 baskets full left over. And that was just 5,000 dudes. That's not even the women and the children gathered. 18, 19,000 people with five dinner loaves and two little sardines. That's a good story. I wouldn't share that one. It's a good one, though. It's a good one, though. Walking on water, man, that's a great story. I've tried that before, filled the bathtub, jumped in the bathtub, and I'm like, I sink. I wouldn't share that one either. I wouldn't share that story. Oh, he's risen indeed, hallelujah, thanks for sharing. No, that's the one I would do. That's it. You see, Peter could have picked anything in all of the Bible. Peter could have picked any moment in all all of Scripture. Now remember, Peter is in the book of Acts, and they didn't have Matthew and Mark and Luke and John written yet. Those, they were still, they, they had just got done living those moments. Their Bible, their Scriptures would have been the Old Testament. And so they've got Genesis through Malachi, and they're great books of the Bible, right? You, we've got stories in the Old Testament too that we like. Stories like Noah and the ark, Moses and the Red Sea, We've got stories like the, the one we just read today about Isaiah. Love that story. Who will send for me and who will I, who will I send and who will go for me? Here am I, send me. Love that one. That was part of my ordination about 20 years ago, 19 years ago. These are great stories. Peter could have picked any of them, but instead he looks at them and he says, hey guys, they're not drunk like you think they are. This man, Jesus, this man that, that you saw with miracles and signs and the, the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water and all the other things you saw Jesus do, this man, this is great. I love this. I, I absolutely love this about, about Peter. He says, a man attested to you by God by mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. So, so like, like you were there and you saw this. Now let's kind of time frame this real quick. We are now seven weeks after the resurrection of Jesus. Seven weeks. Seven weeks. Do you know where you were seven weeks ago? Yeah, probably here, because it was Easter. Okay, all right. So, seven weeks prior, seven weeks ago, this, this event happened. He goes, through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, verse 23, 
this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, this is great. This is Peter being Peter. Now, Peter could have like dumbed this down and made it a little bit easier, but Peter looks at these guys gathered. Now, he's in front of like the supreme court of his day. He's in front of all these leader people and, and all these high up and to-do people within the church body, and he looks at them and he says, this Jesus was delivered up you killed him. Like, not, not you as in mankind, or, or you as in all the general peoples of the world who ever would live. No, you as in Frank. Frank, you killed him. And Tom, sorry, if there's a Frank here, like, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but like, but Frank, Tom, Bob, Jill, you people, you killed him. Like, literally, you held the nails, and you yelled the things, and the Barabbas guy was out there, and you're like, I want, I'd rather have the known criminal guy as opposed to this passive, peaceful Jesus guy who says he's God. I just kill that guy. Like, you were there, and you did it, and you yelled it, and you did the thing. And Peter says, that, That's the one message Peter wants to proclaim. The one message Peter chooses to proclaim, it's not Noah and the ark, it's not Moses in the Red Sea, it's, it's none of that. It's, it's Jesus dead. Jesus died. But more than that, this, this man you crucified and you killed at the hands of your own lawlessness. Anybody know my favorite word in the Bible? Nothing is a really good one, right? That's a really good one. I love that word. There's another one. Okay, okay. Anybody remember, um, there, there's a, a, a girl who used to worship here. Her name's Morgan. She's got, a, she's got this word that I absolutely love. She did a children's message one time, and she was doing the thing, and she was teaching, and she goes, the big old butt of God. Now, 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 get the picture out of your mind. I'm not talking like that. The butt of God is when you're going down one direction, and everything's going bad, and all of a sudden, but God. But God. It means, it means turn around and go the absolute opposite direction. But God. You killed him, you crucified him, you hung him on a cross, you wanted nothing good to happen to him, but God rose him, raised him from the dead. But God. Peter could have taught anything in all the world. He could have taught anything in the entire history of the Old Testament, and yet he chose in that moment the one thing that is the most foundational to everybody, everything that you and I are as followers of Jesus today. That's the death and the resurrection of Christ. So how many of you have the Bible memorized? Really? In case you're wondering, nobody raised their hand. Nobody. I don't have the Bible memorized. See, I, I, think, I think we make this whole following Jesus thing just, just a smidge too hard. I think we, we start wondering that if if I don't know the whole Bible, I shouldn't say anything about the Bible. We live our lives sometimes saying that I, I don't know the whole story. I don't have Genesis through Revelation memorized, so I, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. I can't tell you the whole story, so I'm not going to tell you any of the story. But what if I told you you don't need to know the whole story? What if I told you you don't have to have the whole thing memorized? What if I told you there's only one thing you absolutely have to know? Now, please understand, Genesis through Revelation, the entire Bible, is really, really good stuff. And it's all really, really important. And you really, really should read it because God really, really gave it to you. And that's the thing. The whole of the Bible, all of it is really good. But if you can't memorize the whole of the Bible, if you don't know everything, I'm going to tell you the one thing that you absolutely need to know. It's the same thing that Peter chose to know in that moment. Jesus died and was raised. That's, that's the most important thing you'll ever hear. Some people wonder, how in the world can you uh, be a part of a Christian church? What makes the Christian faith different from every other religious tradition ever known to mankind? What makes the, the whole Christian thing different? How do you believe in this thing as opposed to something else? Why Jesus? You know why? Do you know how I can believe this as opposed to anything else? Because of what Peter says right here. Because you know what? Peter saw it. He didn't testify to something that was written. He didn't say, well, when I was in Sunday school, I learned Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He didn't, he didn't do that. 
He didn't say, we had this really cool Bible story about this boy named David, and he fought against this giant named Goliath. No, he didn't do that. He said, Jesus died and rose. I saw it. You saw it. We're not drunk. We're so overcome by this event in history. Let me put it another way. The source and the foundation of our faith is not a book. It's not a gathering. It's an event. And that event is the resurrection. That event is the foundation of all that we believe, of all that we are. Genesis through Revelation, really, really powerful stuff. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Genesis through Malachi aren't about you. Genesis through Malachi are about God's chosen people, the Israelites. There are two covenants in the Bible, the old covenant and the new covenant. When Jesus came, he says, I came to fulfill the old. Not to abolish it, still read it, still know it. It's still really, really important because all of it points to Jesus. But, but you and I are not the point of the old covenant. You and I are not the point of the Old Testament. God's chosen people, the Israelites, the people who were born of Abraham's lineage by birth, they are the point of the old covenant. I've wondered if we really understood what Jesus was about, we'd get upset about different things. I get upset sometimes when I look at the world and I realize that people are trying to erase symbols of God from our world. I think of things like the Ten Commandments. They used to be displayed in prominent places on, on public grounds. And we get all upset about that. Can I tell you something? Ten Commandments aren't written for you. They're written for the Israelite people. Now, now they're really good. Now, please don't, 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 don't like hang me right here. Just listen, listen to me here. Hear me out. God's Ten Commandments are the summary or the index, or, or the, rather the table of contents of God's law. They're the table of contents of everything that God has to tell us in the Old Testament. You, you want to list out the commandments of God? There's about 600 and some out of those things. But we pick these 10 and we're like, yeah, these 10 are the ones we're going to focus on. But, but what about the commandment in the Old Testament that says, um, if, if a woman um, it sees someone fighting, this is the book, book of Leviticus, really awful stuff, by the way. I mean, like, you can read it. It's, it's a good book. It's Bible. But this is awful. Like, these are laws that are actually in the Bible. And um, this one's kind of a little bit raw, so I'll just give it to you anyway. Sorry for little ears. But if, if there is a, a woman who grabs, who sees, a, who sees someone fighting with her husband, and she grabs that man by his private parts, you should cut off her hand and show her no pity. We should put that one in our courthouses. Why did that one not make it into our courthouses and onto our Capitol buildings? Well, because that's weird. I mean, like, literally, that's weird. Now, I, I really and truly think that like, you shouldn't murder and you shouldn't steal and, and all those things, but, but those are so pathetic compared to what the new covenant is. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. The Old Testament is great, and the Ten Commandments are fantastic, and I believe you should follow them. But that's only half the story. Because what does Jesus say in the New Testament? Here's what we should fight for. Here's what you and I should fight for in our world. Not that the Ten Commandments get displayed in courthouses and capitol buildings around our country. But let's go with the commands that Jesus gives. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says it's not okay just to not kill them, but you need to look out for them. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. He says, it's not okay just not to steal from them. You actually need to find a way to help them live a better life. It's not okay just to honor your mother and your father. You need to lovingly look out for them, care for them, and set them up for a better future. This is what Jesus takes the Old Testament law, and he amps it up. He has replaced the old covenant with a new covenant. It even says that Jesus came to establish a new and greater covenant. You don't put a new and greater something where an old something is. You put it where an old something was. So here we have Peter. And he's standing there in front of all of the people who want nothing to do with this Jesus guy. 
And you're like, why are you speaking this message? And he says, because he gave us something that nothing else could give us. Why do I believe in Jesus? Why do you believe in Jesus? I hope the answer is because Jesus is the only founder of any religious tradition anywhere in history who actually raised again. Every other faith system in the entire world is built on a dead man. Every faith tradition in history is built on a grave. Christianity is built on an empty one. And it's not an empty grave because everyone thought it was going to be empty. Because on Easter morning, the women went to the tomb to see a dead man and to embalm him. After the resurrection, after the death of Christ, the disciples went to the upper room and locked themselves in because they were terrified that what happened to Jesus was going to happen to them. They weren't waiting for Jesus to come and be like, hey, go do the thing now. They were like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do now? Peter, after seeing the resurrection, became a totally different person. If you and I saw a resurrected Jesus, I think we would be a different person too. If you and I actually believed that the resurrection was the key, the pinnacle, the foundation of everything the church stands for, I think you and I would be different as well. We would recognize that the Father has wrapped his arms around a world that he created and established for our good. We would recognize that Jesus not only was a really good guy who, who fed 5,000 and walked on, on water and then fed 7,000 and you know, all these other things, like whatever, like, he did all these things, right? He's... He's the Savior who died and rose. If we were to really wrestle with the resurrection and really let the resurrection be the launching point for everything we do, we would let the Spirit take up root in our hearts and we would live as the Father's children, brothers and sisters with the King of Kings, empowered by His Spirit to live a different kind of life. How much of God is enough of God? The resurrection is all you need to make a faith system completely different than anything this world will ever offer you. Read your Bible. Read all of your Bible, Genesis through Revelation. Read the Old Covenant. Know your Ten Commandments. Know the rules and the laws and the boundaries that God sets for you. But do so in the context and through the lens of Jesus dying, rising, and soon returning. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we serve a God who is creator of all, redeemer of all, and sustainer of all, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it is that reality that sets you and I up to be able to stand in the face of lawless men and women and say, he died for you, but God raised him from the dead, and that's all I need to know. Would you pray with me today? Gracious Father, you have given us so much in your word, so rich, so powerful. What you've given us in the Old Testament is a covenant between you and your people, Israel, and you've taken that and expanded it to not a covenant just with those people built around sacrifices and rules, but now you've expanded that upon the entire world. And you've given us a new covenant, a new covenant built on grace and the completed work of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, fill us with a desire to know and believe and claim the resurrection as our hope. Father, we pray that wherever we would go, you would give us the strength and the courage, the courage that the men and women in the New Testament church had, the courage that would be able to stand in front of rulers, accusers, officials, and say, I cannot in good conscience do anything other than proclaim the resurrection. Father, give us the conviction of your Holy Spirit to be able to proclaim boldly that the resurrection is the ticket that makes everything different. Amen.